All right, welcome. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Nico. I'm the company scout here in Berlin for the German Accelerator. This is my colleague Konstantin from Munich, also yeah. company scout. Um, quick energy exercise because the air is pretty terrible in here. If everyone could get up uh, and introduce him or herself uh, to their neighbor. Come on, Come stand on. up, introduce yourself. <laughs> A little energy into the room. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Okay, that's enough. Thanks, guys. Hopefully, this is also a conversation breaker, so you guys um, know that this is a workshop where we don't want to talk alone. So if you have questions, just raise them. Yeah, just give us a signal or whatever, and uh, we're open uh, to discuss as much as uh, you need to know. Um, first of all, maybe a little background. Why do Nico and I do this? We, we are entrepreneurs ourselves, so I had my own company the last eight years, and we started off in Germany, and we had, in the end, just engineering in Germany, and we did all our sales, marketing, all distribution outside of Germany in the United States. And so I've built quite a, quite a reputation and also some knowledge about uh, the United States in my last eight years. And um, now I try to bring that message to Germany that the United States is an important market and how do you uh, get accelerated over there. Nico? Yeah, as for me, I studied in the US and also um, sold and marketeered uh, in the US um, for a small company you might have heard of called Groupon. Um, and I'm here, I'm very excited to, uh, you know, share some uh, lessons learned. We actually brought along some of our alumni companies as well, um, who are, were part of the German Accelerator in the past um, and are still in it um, to a certain extent. Uh, we'd like to keep this as interactive as possible. Um, so first question, I actually like to know uh, who are here like founders, uh, startup entrepreneurs who think, of, okay. Right, that's awesome. So, um, yeah, this is for you. So, uh, please feel free to ask questions. Um, we have a rough guideline. We we brought along a few slides um, of core messages, um, but we'd like to keep it interactive. And we also want to like then um, basically ask our founders here what their lessons learned were um, to those specific points. So Maybe you guys can quickly introduce yourself. Yeah. And Sure, sure. Uh, hello, my name is Sebastian. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Mosaic. Uh, we're an enterprise conversational platform. We enable uh, companies, large enterprises, to connect with their customers in voice messaging and connect the relevant employees with, with the customer over the whole customer journey. And um, yeah, we are currently in the US and have been in the Accelerator in Q1 this year. Hi, my name is Wolfram and my company is Phrase App. Um, we are based out of Hamburg and we help almost a thousand companies around the world internationalizing their software. And um, the US is still our largest market. We attended the GA program in early 2016. Nice. Hi, my name is Jonathan. I'm the CEO and founder of Opinio. We do real-time market research via, via mobile app and are trying to get people to do market research again because as we all know, market research sucks. And we're currently the fastest market research tool I've been in, in, in the US in Q4 2016, so it's been a while. And yeah, happy to answer any questions if I can. All right, great to have you here, guys. Uh, that's amazing. So let's go. Uh, why is the US important? So first of all, uh, let's talk about the ecosystem. And um, everyone says, okay, what is this ecosystem? Ecosystem means you have access uh, to global players. And uh, that is really important. I mean, if you come from Germany, we have some global players here as well, but they're really old school, right? Yeah, we have Siemens, we have all the car manufacturers, but we don't have any tech companies who are really interacting on a global level besides SAP. And in the US, if you go to the Silicon Valley, you have access to all these big brands, to the big four, of course, and they can not only be an exit channel for you, but they can also be a client for you and, uh, and a partner and can really help you uh, and uh, get back. Um, yeah, well, it is a cultural and geographical melting pot. You know, just the sheer size of the US, 50 states who are to a certain extent all very similar, but then, you know, um, basically it's 
it's a lot of cultures coming together, especially on the west and the east coast, as you all know, um, you know, with the major hubs like New York, San Francisco, LA. Um, what's interesting is that, um, you know, there's, when, when cultures collide, um, there's obviously very often new opportunities created and, um, you know, a lot of creative spirit. Actually, I'd like to know from Sebastian to what extent you know, this, this whole melting pot that San Francisco is to, um, to a certain extent. Um, how did you benefit from that? Um, well, uh, first of all, even if you're abroad, there's always a German community. So it's also part of the melting pot. And I, 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 in the first instance, I probably have laughed about that. But then I quickly learned that from the German community, you get into the Swiss, into the French, into the Dutch, and then it extends and extends. <clears throat> this is really an interesting door opener. At the same time, I think, um, like, we started out working from co-working spaces. We, we met a lot of people, and you have a shared mindset with those people. So if you have companies coming from India, if you have companies coming from Germany, or have companies from the UK, it really doesn't matter. Everybody is there new. Right. Everybody has to, to understand how the ecosystem functions, and there is a plain, plain field for everybody, right? So no one cares actually where you're from, and no one actually cares that you are there. 200,000 new people coming to San Francisco, 200,000 new companies each year. Um, so it's up to you to find your, your position in this melting pot and right. just work on it. And everybody does it. So I think that is very enlightening to understand, you know, you're just one of many and just go and, and, and go and work on it. Cool. Also for market research, I can assume the U.S. is quite, uh, quite interesting, right, with this mix of cultures? Um, okay, how... How, how do you want me to answer that question? <laughs> um, do you mean do you mean like in terms of the, 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 the multiplot, or like how did I perceive personal, personally? The, personally, what what is your experience? The, I mean, in Germany, we yeah. have a quite um, quite normal mix of people uh, in comparison to what you see in the U.S. Uh, well, that that that's true. Um, I should say that we um, did not do like any qualitative market research while I was there, mm -hmm. so um, we didn't benefit from, from, the, from the melting pot, like from a business perspective. But um, of course, personally, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's very encouraging and very, very, uh, very interesting to, to be around so many different people, which we, you don't have in Hamburg, where everything Absolutely. is um, pretty, pretty aligned and uh, not as inspirational as, as it is in Silicon Valley. Um, so from a personal perspective, it was very interesting. From a business perspective, um, yeah, we didn't benefit that much from, from so many people being around there. Yeah. So what we've also seen is um, two things. First of all, uh, it can also be a very, very good hub for Asia, uh, especially if you're on the West Coast. There are a lot, a lot of Asian people, so it's very easy because they all speak English to tap into Asian markets to see what their mindset is, how they, how they benefit and um, how they perceive your software and then maybe ma make the next step to Asia. It's much easier than what you see here. Also, if you have a product for a niche market, the niche is probably much, much larger over there uh, than what it's here. Just Which as a hint, we're not going to get through the slides if you like. Yeah, we just speed it up. Hyper growth capital. Um, yeah, thankfully now in Germany, you know, you, you can fairly easy get seed, pre seed, Series A, to a certain extent also Series B money. But as you all know, you know, the, the big rounds uh, for the big visions um, of these global platforms that get closed over there. So hyper growth capital, unfortunately, you still uh, find more in the US and in Asia. Uh, these days, um, might shift uh, at some point. You know, once we we really uh, have a few, um, you know, unicorn exits here in Europe or more, um, we already had a few, but uh, the hyper growth is still over there. So, um, let's bring us um, to how customers are structured. A lot of people think, um, hey, uh, the Americans are just English-speaking guys, and probably it's extremely hard to sell to them, especially as a German. But um, I think Sebastian can share us the story uh, how it is to to sell to Americans. Oh, well, first of all, I think they they're much more personal. Um, so when you're selling to a company, you're also selling to a person or 
as we also all know in Germany, also you're also selling to a champion. I can only speak for enterprise uh, sales in this case, so I think that's a little bit more specific. But um, the relationship building is, is actually fundamental. And I think if you arrive in the US, you really have to understand that those persons are very straightforward, very direct, but at the same time appreciate if you build uh, like a meaningful relationship with them first. Um, the intros, the connections, the network is fundamental. And then at the same time, um, it's a number game. So you have a lot of companies, you have like huge companies that are willing to take a totally, totally different risk than we see it here in, in the US, in, in Europe. And so approaching people, getting people to know through your network, talking about the, the asset, the value that you can bring to their company is often the door opener that even large companies are willing to, to cooperate and work with a small startup to test that, to, to create like an, an edge over, over competition within their field. So they see, see you rather as an enabler than, than as a risk to, to their operational side. And I think that is like something, something that has stuck with me fundamentally. Yeah, yeah maybe I can pitch in on that because um in Germany, selling something always had, has a bad taste, and networking is always like, okay, yeah, fuck off, you're not doing anything, you're just networking. And in, and in, in the US, it's uh, the total opposite, and people are actually very approachable, no matter like, what they do or, or how, far, how far they are in the company. So for instance, I was there, and we do market research, as you just said, and like four days into Silicon Valley, I was uh, having coffee with the survey monkey president. Was, which is like a billion dollar company and one of the biggest biggest companies uh, in Silicon Valley. And that just really describes like how supportive and approachable the community is in Silicon Valley. And I think that's why they're so, uh, so successful in what they do. And that's why all the big companies actually come from Silicon Valley. Absolutely. They take it serious, I would say. Um, you're not recognized as a startup over there. They see you equally to a big corporation that pitches the same product. They say, okay, we give you the right, the same chance, right? They don't, they see a chance in you, not a risk like a German company would do. All right, uh, let's continue. Um, the last one is obvious, of course. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is the largest market in the world. And there's a reason for us to go over there because if we grow in Germany and Europe, this can be significantly, but you will never be a global player. Um, the US Americans have the huge benefit that if they grow on their home market, they are already a global player when they now then open up and, and come to Europe and uh, come to other markets. So in order to play on the same level, we have to go over there and attack this market. This is, I think, the key lesson for it. All right, let's uh, talk about business style. Um, because now you know, okay, the US market is important. What, what will I find there? And uh, maybe you can uh, talk from your experience, how are Americans different like, uh, to Germans? Like what, what was your most, what, what stick to your mind when you, when you did business over there and business meetings? I think it's pr pretty much was what Jonathan already said. Um, so um, it's quite easy to get an uh, initial introduction and to talk to uh, people at every company level. But um, what I now see after, I mean, uh, it's been two years and I've been back to the US um, almost every other month. And um, the long-term relationship actually is um, the thing that we benefit most from. So uh, one introduction leads to another. This doesn't happen um, within a short time frame of weeks. This um, sometimes, from my experience, can take months. Um, but um, it's, it's kind of yeah similar probably to the German network where um, you kind of recognize the same faces here at the NOR conference, for example. But um, it's pretty similar in the Valley, but uh, you need to spend some time there to, to really uh, get this feeling, is my experience. All right, good thing. And the one thing that you will initially recognize when you write out emails over there, you're German. And what you do is you, you use the correct form, the correct intro, you write best regards in the end, and then back comes just one short email, right? One sentence, boom. And what's the reason for this? They really love Siri and all their little tools, and they really, time is money. This is, this is how they operate, and they don't want to spend time uh, with forms or uh, taking attention to something. So they quickly write in the car or dictate into their phone in the car. And it doesn't, don't underestimate these short emails. They, don't, they still take you serious. They still mean it honest. It's just their way, way to communicate, especially in New York. You will probably not get a really nice sized email with a lot of content, and it's just one sentence. Okay. And that's it. And then you know, okay, cool, I'm probably in the next step, or uh, the meeting is agreed upon, and, and I can move forward. And then, yeah, tell us something about the time of the day you have to wake up. 
So yeah, this is a very common thing in Silicon Valley, um, especially when you when you want to meet investors. Um, they're usually family people, uh, and from personal experience, you know, I met investors at 6:30 in the morning um, for like uh, a coffee, uh, walk and talk. Uh, they sometimes call it or breakfast meetings, and. Um, that uh, if you live in San Francisco, for instance, you know, that can um, be uh, quite of a hassle because you have to drive to um, Palo Alto uh, and that's kind of a drive. So you really have to get up at four o'clock <laughs> to, to make that meeting uh, sometimes. But um, yeah, it can be worth it. Um, but uh, yeah, the culture is that you do a lot uh, over lunch, over breakfast, um, very rarely over dinner, like we tend to do. Um, because, you know, investors in particular, they want to be uh, with their families in, at night time. And why is this challenging? Uh, the, the morning is actually, these, these are the only, this is the only overlap you have with Germany. And what typical German founders do in the morning, they check their German emails, and they, they try to jump on the phone with their German team and German company, and then when they're done, maybe at 11, 12 o'clock, and I finished all the work from Germany, um, business day is over, basically, in the valley because everything happens in the morning over there. All the business, the, the, the intros and everything. So you really have to have your mind in the morning in the valley in the US. You can't worry about Germany. We'll come to that point later again, uh, but this is extremely important over there. And then also fast decisions. Have you guys um, seen how, how US Americans operate and in terms uh, against, like for example, what we see here in Europe or Germany? How is the, how's the speed uh, and how do they, do they make decisions? Any significant differences? Sebastian, maybe? The speed is impressive, but I think it is in all parts of the business, speed is impressive. I mean, if you have that kind of salary levels, if you have a kind of that organizations, um, you have very rigid decision making. So if someone gives you a call and say, okay, I want to have that solution tomorrow, you better deliver tomorrow because otherwise he looks for someone else. Uh, so I think it's like they, they're not waiting in the risk that much allows them to speed up even more. I don't know what kind of experience do you have? Pretty much the same. Yeah. I think the, the response uh, um, the responses are done in a way shorter time frame than here. I always try to um, get my company to that speed um, over here, but uh, it's, still, it's still quite a challenge. But um, yeah, if you, it's basically, if, for example, if you send out an email and you don't get a reply after a day or two, then that pretty much um, um, is your answer there. But um, usually, um, yeah, the, on average, I would say um, it's all about speed. It's all about um, quick communications, and also um, it's it's about quick meeting meetings. Which um, actually, um, I run into um, kind of scheduling ahead. Um, I, w I want to schedule ahead meetings, and then realized um, that um, you only need a day or two. Um, to to uh, ask for a meeting and then actually actually um, have the meeting happening. So um, yeah, that's definitely a little quicker than than over here in Germany. I think what's also important is inside organizations, the decision making process is extremely quick. So what you've probably heard is that um, you don't have like normal lawyering contracts like we have here in Germany. Uh, you uh, people are there at will. That means you have a fire and hire culture, and that also means this is not only bad for people, it's also an opportunity. Because if you see that someone doesn't work out, uh, in Germany what we typically do, especially if the guy is after the probit side and you discovered it a little bit late, you think, okay, let's put some resources on it, let's develop this guy, let's bring him further, and maybe we have a chance to develop him into something. That will never happen in the US. In the US, they really make a quick decision, and you're, you have to do that. Salaries are insane over there especially uh, in, in engineering, but also in sales. And if you don't, if you keep a bad apple in the basket, that the thing will spread and um, you need to make a very fast decision and let people go or hire quickly new people that are good. Yeah. You want to say something to that? Yeah, I would just want to say, and it's also vice versa, right? Yeah. So the, the, the people in your company would see if you would keep someone who's not performing, the rest of your team would leave. Yeah. They would yeah. just say, this is a company that is not performing. I'm holding stock in this company. This is not giving me an opportunity to make a decent return, so I'm better off to the next company. There are thousands of companies looking for good people. So if you're in that environment, this really also drives your own organization and your own skills and in that direction. I think that is what I really appreciate about it. Absolutely. All right, and then, um, of course, you all heard about the salesman mentality uh, that's, that exists over there. Um, 
the US is extremely driven by money. Money, money, money is everything. And it frustrated me a little bit because I thought, hey, this whole purpose leadership is something that came out of the US. But if you look at salespeople, still what motivates the most is money. And, um, if, and everything works towards um, at the end of the month, the end of the quarter, where they try to close their deals. And then these guys sometimes really start to pressure you. And also, they, they never take no as an answer. Uh, if, if, if you say, no, I'm not interested, that means, OK, maybe it's not the right time, and we try it a second time and a third time. Have you had the same experience there? Um, well, I, w I think I'm a pushy person myself, so I uh, fit into that salesman, <laughs> salesman <laughs> mentality in the US uh, quite well. Um, but it's, it's definitely more accepted because every, everyone acts the same. And while in Germany, if you're too pushy, it's perceived to be very rude. And um, sometimes people will react, you know, very, very un unpolitely. And in the US, it's like normal. They they tell you, okay, well, you didn't try hard enough. And sometimes you have to write like six emails and uh, have to make five calls in order to get a meeting. And then it's fine. And nobody will say, okay, dude, why did you call me five times? So um, that is, uh, I think that's that's a good thing. It's more accepted, and everybody everybody's doing their business, and everybody accepts it and um, it's like a win or lose mentality and the winners are those who are having like the most grit and um, are the most bold, I guess. You, get, the respect. Boldest. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. get respect for being persistent. It's not seen as a rude thing and uh, that's a qu quite a difference. Um, and then of course, Nico, messaging and storytelling is huge and this is something Germans can, can learn, right? Totally. Um I think Americans, we kind of learn a lot from Americans when it comes to messaging and storytelling. They're just really good communicators. Um, I see it a lot in pitches over here in Germany. You know, Germans tend to like present, you know, the problem and then the solution and then certain features. Americans, when they pitch their startup, they always start with a big vision. And, you know, sometimes you can't even like comprehend what that person's talking about. Um, but you know, they, f they phrase it in a way and they frame it in a way that you think, wow, th you know, this, this is fascinating. I want to I wanna get to know more. And this is exactly what they're good at. So they put a needle in your brain where you're like, okay, this is th that guy seems to have something shiny. I'd like to know more about it. A really good metaphor I heard is um, Germans tend to hear the problem. And we learned that, right? We ha have to listen to our clients and understand the problem. But then we often comes come with the solution directly. It's like, if you're sleepy and you have problems with your sleep uh, and you tell me that and I say, okay, I have a bed for you, then m maybe you're buying from me, right? Because bed is exactly the solution you were looking for, but maybe you were thinking about maybe a couch or maybe a mattress or futon or something different. So what Americans do is they don't come with a solution, they explain you the way how to come to a solution. So they build up trust with you, they build up like a thought leadership and t tell you why they are experts in the field, and then they say, because of all that research and all that the thing, we think our product is the best for you. And then they actually catch the people they're selling to you, and then they're actually, um, actually able to close. Yeah. All right, um, and then you mentioned that in the beginning, uh, network and like this, uh, or, or you did it, right? Network and also trust is extremely important over there. Um, LinkedIn is like forget Xing. If you're if you're on Xing, you can shut that down. Nobody knows Xing, even the, when they try to change their name from OpenBC to Xing and internationalize. LinkedIn is the platform. Um, the life is uh, going on on this platform, and then uh, like building up your network is the most important thing. People get tons of emails over there. Like they, they're swamped with 50 to 60 emails from other startups who pitch their ideas, from other people trying to sell them something. And because they're persistent, right, and they have the salesman mentality and they come after these guys, um, they even get more emails. So how do you, how do you, get, not, or how do you get recognized? And the only way to, to uh, do that is by a warm introduction. And this is something where the German Accelerator really can help. We have a network of mentors over there, and we try uh, to get you in contact with people uh, in the big corporations, in the target uh, market, um, to actually help you with that. Have you recognized this during your time over there? Yes. 
<laughs> it's good. <laughs> good quick answer. So, how how did it work to work with our mentors and like, what what do they do for you? Yeah, I can talk a little bit about that because uh, I did that in the Q1, uh, having a mentor network, having workshops, and now also doing it because I'm moving to the US currently. And um, what is really cool, our mentor, for example, is a Google venture funded uh, company. They do, I think, like two, three digit million revenue a year, tech company. This guy started the company with uh, zero revenue and brought it to 100 million plus in revenue. And if you have such people, they actually know pretty clever people as well. And they don't mind at all to introduce you to them. And so if you have topics, he has exactly an idea who solved that before and uh, who is the right pe person to ask to and gives you an overview about the, the ecosystem. And um, I had problems even in my German product team that I could solve within 24, seven hour, uh, seven, 24, 24 hours because someone in the valley did that 200 times before, sketched out the problem, sketched out the solution. I took a picture and sent it to Germany and we fixed it. And that's kind of the, the mindset that you have. So if you have a problem, you can potentially go to your competitor and ask how they solved it and they will tell you. And, and this is kind of a network-driven thing, and especially if you have the ability with the German Accelerator to, to have such a network. I don't know, I'm not sure. You've got 60 mentors in, in that area, I think, yeah, or something like that. 60, so yeah. if you just think that they all probably have between 500 and 1,000 contacts on LinkedIn, this is a decent multiplier to, to reach out to the people you want to talk to and, and, and find solutions to your problems. Absolutely. All right, so now you know why the US is important and like how it how life is in the US and how this whole um, business works over there. Now let's talk about homework. How do you bring your startup over to the US? There are a couple of important points. And the first thing is you need funding. The US is extremely expensive. And in order to make it, you have to somehow fund for it. Um, maybe you got, I can give you a story. Um, you're not in the US anymore, right? Right, but um, actually, I disagree. You do not need funding for your company. Okay. You need funding um, to pay for flights and, and especially for, for your apartment and um, for your Uber <laughs> bills. So just to, um, to give you a rough estimate, we um, stayed, we, um, me and my co-founder um, kind of were, were um, moved between Hamburg and, and San Francisco and we just rented a one bedroom apartment back then that was two years ago, it's probably more expensive now. We spent like two and a half thousand dollars for, for that apartment. I think I had, I had an, we had Uber bills on average um, at uh, 1,500 per month. Um, but th that was also because we just used um, Uber to, to get around, which is from, besides the Caltrain, the only way to get around in, uh, in the Bay Area. And then, um, yeah, you basically roughly estimate you probably need 5K per month per a person to, um, to really um, make use of your, your time there and, and to attend the meetings that you want to attend. And then also, if you want to hire people, um, a typical sales, a senior sales account executive gets 150 to 200K base salary. And they typically top off uh, like 500,000, 600,000 of their commission. So you need also uh, the sales and, and the leads in order to support that, right? Because they want to earn that money. They earned that before. They, they have the lifestyle for it. They have the house, the, the car, the kids. They live on debt. Right? And if, you, if they don't buy this, uh, if they don't get that salary from you, they will not work from you because they cannot finance their lifestyle. And this is something you have to consider. Your first VP of sales, and this is not enough, we talk about it later, that you need a sales machinery. The first VP of sales probably will cost you 250000 to 300000 in the in the valley. And uh, also in New York, by the way. And it, it gets cheaper if you go to other areas, which is a recommendation I can do, but I can make. But, um, Still, this is something your company has to be able to pay for uh, to do this. So funding is definitely something, not only for personal life, but also like for the business expansion. And yeah, then, ju ju just yeah. on a side note on that, um, what if you want to hire in New York or in the Bay Area, it's definitely at that price, but um, there's a lot of space and a lot of um, cities in between, um, which are also worth looking into, and um, salaries there are much closer to, to um, the salaries here. So, depending on the role, of course, but um, we, for example, um, are still looking um, into opening an office in, in Utah, uh, which, which I never, never thought of before, but that was also an outcome of, of the program. All right. 
So, uh, and then of course you have to know your competition. Did you have any competition for your product over there when you, when you went? Um, yeah, well it was uh, SurveyMonkey. <laughs> Um, that's, the, that's pretty hard. <laughs> the, 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 big, the biggest competitor. Um, and when I, when I actually went over there, our product wasn't really ready yet. It was for us a little bit too early. Um, so what I did mostly was just doing business development and was trying to find a product market fit and see if there's potential for us, which uh, was validated after three months. Um, but we weren't ready. We didn't have any sales team. We didn't hire any people. Um, our processes in, back in Germany, we went, went ready to really um, take it up on SurveyMonkey. So they, they, they were our competitor, but um, I don't think they saw us as their competitors yet. <laughs> All right, I see. So we have this famous quote. Nico, maybe you can say something uh, to it. Yeah, I just wanted to say one more thing to the know your competitors. It's, it's super crucial that you know your competitors and how much money they raised, especially when you go and talk to investors. Because if you don't know your industry really well, you know it's not going to uh, reflect very positively on you. Um, and you also need it in order to actually sell uh, efficiently. Because you know, um, an awful lot of times, um, the person you're selling to knows exactly uh, what kind of solutions are out there, and they're going to ask like, "How's your product better than SurveyMonkey? Why shouldn't I stick to SurveyMonkey?" So you really have to like, you know, have your objection handling down, um, and it's super crucial that you get that sorted. Why it presents a huge opportunity market is very crowded. Um, this is actually an experiment uh, that we did um, uh, out of the German accelerator. It's saying, so it was you know, basically first outreach uh, lead generation um, measure, and then the person responded, I get 35 similar requests every day, just can't accommodate. Thanks for your understanding. Plan. So, you know, um, it's a crowded market out there. There are tons of startups that do properly something similar, have a similar solution, try to get to the similar people. So this is a res very, very typical response you get. You have to think, how can I get on the top of the inbox? How can I really uh, try these people? That's why it's important to know your competition, important to know the messaging they're using to, to get attention and to, to get on the top of the inbox of the decision makers. And you need to think about maybe there is a different different way I can I can um, get to and get the attention from people that matter. And then you talked about product market fit uh, real quick. Did you did you saw very big differences from the German market? And did you had to adopt the product a lot? Um, no, I found that as Germans we're often Often, oftentimes, you want to, want to make the product too perfect, and nobody expects in, in the US to be to have a product that is actually perfectly done. Um, so, and that was like a learning I had. Maybe I should have been like more aggressive with our product back then because it was already good enough to sell in the US. But I thought, okay, well, the product isn't ready yet. I'm, I'm just going to focus on talking and not on selling that much. Um, so, I think sometimes. As Germans in general need to be more more bold when it comes to their own company, when it comes to their product, because as you said, the Americans are champions in selling, but I think in in terms of the product, as Germans are equal, if not better. Absolutely, German engineering has a huge brand over there, and I mean you're you're selling to the US, right? You're not over there anymore, yes. but you're still selling. How does this work? So. Uh, the compromise we found uh, from a financial perspective is, was uh, hiring Americans in our Hamburg office. And um, they work a little later than, than the Germans do. We, we, uh, and um, that kind of does the trick for us, at least a little bit. Um, product market fit, fit wise, we realized uh, pretty um, quickly that um, companies in the US take their product internationally way later, pretty much what you uh, said at the beginning. And so we um, really had to put some thought into how, which, which segments um, of the market do we address, uh, what's the difference to the European companies that work with us. And we, I think we would, wouldn't have thought it through if we wouldn't have spent the time over in, in San Francisco. So yeah, the German accelerator is a chance to adjust your product market fit and to make it ready. Not every product can be translated directly to the US market, but still a lot of people in Germany think it's a huge effort and it isn't that much. 
most of the times you can already start selling because they never, what you said is perfectly right. I can double that down, right? Um, they don't expect a perfect product. It's not like that you get a request catalog. These are the features you need to solve and you need to tick every single box. In Germany, that's true. The decision maker wants to look at the list and see every single box ticked. And you have to explain yourself if you don't tick one of the boxes. In the US, if you just tick one box and he says, wow, cool, you solved that problem, let's give it a try. And then we find other solutions for the other problems we have. And you can still sell. So this is something, this is a mentality change you really have to do. And I think it's, it's quite good uh, to enter the market. All right, we talked about location real quick. Um, go east, go west is, of course, important, the decision, but there's a lot, a lot in the middle. And um, let me explain real quick about the middle, and then you talk about east coast, west coast. Um, we, my company founded uh, their US subsidiary in um, Silicon Valley. Uh, and we had a shared office desk there, and then we moved to Berkeley, which is still Bay Area and still expensive, didn't help that much. And then we also went to Utah, so Lake City, and to Boulder, Colorado, which has an amazing university, by the way. And um, salaries are going still up, like Austin, Texas, you all know, was also like one of the secret locations, and then with South by Southwest, it just became this tech mecca. And Boulder is the next tech mecca, um, mark my words, I'm, I'm pretty sure of it. Google is right now building up a campus down there there, and um, people are getting better salaries already, but what's, what's the benefit is, is your people will be able to uh, afford housing and afford good schools for their kids and afford a normal living, and that will make the whole hiring process so, so much better. So don't think only about the big center metropolitan areas, but also think about other areas in the U.S. And then what's the biggest difference between East Coast and West Coast? Why is the East Coast a rising star? Uh, I think for, for German companies in particular because of the time zone, you know, three hours can make a huge difference. So it's, you know, they're just, the East Coast just six hours behind while the West Coast is nine hours behind. And as you mentioned before, you know, you, you want to attend breakfast meetings um, and then the only option is to communicate with your German team is at night. So, but then you need also a few hours to sleep and rest. So, you know, it, it can be a real struggle um, to to manage um, your company in the U.S. and uh, in Germany at the same time. That's why we actually highly recommend against it. So, we, you know, prefer companies that somewhat have a second layer of management that is in command in Germany so that the founders ideally can fo solely focus um, on the U.S. if they decide to go to the West Coast. Um, yeah, which brings us to team. And you you told me earlier that now is the time to go to the U.S. It was not the time you were a little early when you went into the German accelerator program. Why is now the right time for you? What did you change team-wise? Um, because as you said back then, we didn't have a second layer management team, and I was there for three months and had a great time. And I thought, okay, I'm going to move here and. Um, build a billion dollar company and I was really psyched about Silicon Valley and everything. I really want to stay there because my dad lives there as well. So there's, there was some family connection as well. Um, but yeah, but the, the team in Hamburg, uh, yeah, was just not ready for it. I, I had the feeling that the team was falling apart and with the, C, with the CEO being abroad and then we had some management issues as well. So I knew, okay, I could either you know, have a have a great time in Silicon Valley and, you know, do my thing and maybe sell the product. But in the end, the product is made in, made in Hamburg and, and, and the team is in Hamburg. So I had to, yeah, make the decision and uh, I had to move back to Hamburg. Now, two years later, the team is bigger. We have the second layer management team. The product is ready. The, process, the processes are all lined up and um, now I'm moving to the States. But... Um, Oh, I'm planning to move to the States. I'm not uh, as far as uh, Sebastian. But um, yeah, that, that was also a good learning for us. We had a discussion yesterday evening. You remember the quote you gave me with the vacation? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah we, we were talking about you know, what is the right moment. And uh, I knew Jonathan's story, and I also knew that, that other companies had trouble. And so I was a little bit worried when I moved in, in January. Um, second of January, I arrived in the US. And so I, I tried it out before. I said, if, if I can go on holiday for two weeks and my, my office and my team and my company is not burning down, then they probably will <laughs> survive also three months with me, without me. And so they did. And uh, that was also like the, the test that we wanted to do um, to figure out are we in a position to really um, leverage the US and, and make our company run automa automatically without me and, and being, being totally cool with the second layer management team. 
Um, we did that and nothing burned down and, and that's the reason why we then extended by six months and then, then opening an office in Q4 probably in San Francisco. So um, it doesn't necessarily always has to be the founder. It needs a senior, you need a senior guy. You want to build up a team over there, you want to build up culture over there, and don't underestimate the cultural effect. If you don't pay attention to the whole team, the global organization, these teams will split up very, very quickly, and then you have like weird, weird, um, stories, weird balances, and the US team feels disconnected from what's happening in the headquarter, and then they think they're a part and not part of it. So culture is important, but for example, right now we have N26 in the, in the program, um, so uh, this is of course a very large company, but they said, um, we, we have so good contacts uh, to the banking uh, scene over in New York, we want to do this with you guys, and they didn't send one of the, one of the founders, they, they had one guy in Germany, and he said, okay, I will go full force to the US, I'll, I'll run the US operations and I'll do that and my brain is 100% in the US and I don't have to worry about something that, that's going on in Germany. This is the perfect setup. So either you, right, and you have a second layer management that take away all, all the problems and all the thinking about Germany, or you send someone you trust and who, who has been with the company from the first hour on. All right, um, and then of course your product needs to scale. Not only, yeah, time, I know, I know. We have like two minutes, maybe not, or is it? All right, okay, cool. So let's quickly talk about scale. Um, as soon as the machine runs in the US, um, you, you will get a lot, a lot, a lot of customers. And you, your company needs to have um, the support and the capabilities to actually solve that. And maybe a quick number also about sales scaling. Uh, a lot of people don't think in numbers. So for example, this is, this is just an example. If you want to make a 1 to 1.2 million in revenue, and let's say you typically average sales um, um, thing as 1,000, your average package price, you need at least 11 total deals, right? So if you're closer, it is 10%, which is pretty good already. You need uh, 110 meetings or 110 opportunities to make it to that level. And let's say a typical B2B software conversion rate um, from lead to opportunity is 3%. Uh, then you need 3,600 leads in order to make that revenue in the end of the year. And it really helps to... to write these numbers down into an Excel sheet and think about it because you need a sales machine, you need a scalable sales machine to actually fill that funnel with so many leads and then someone, you need people on the ground who can take care of these leads and convert that into opportunities. Um, and that's what I said about KPIs. Know your KPIs. Um, a lot of people, you can extremely quickly waste your money in the US. So if you spend that in wrong channels, if you, for example, try channel partnerships instead of, uh, for example, direct sales, which is not so good in B2B enterprise sales in the US, it, you can burn money extremely quick, also with paid advertising. So know your KPIs, measure every experiment you make over there, and make sure you spend the money in the right areas. And then, must you pitch? And what do you think is the most important thing? So yeah, if you uh, want us to help you guys, um, you know, expand to the US, um, the next uh, deadline is coming up with the 15th of June. Uh, the application process is pretty easy. You just have to upload your deck. Um, it's a great program because we don't take any fees, any equity. It's privately run, but government backed. And uh, I think the most, most essential asset is to leverage our network. Uh, you also get like, you know, perks like free office space uh, and access to uh, you know, all kinds of events. But I think the network of the mentors and the bespoke like, you know, hands-on, one-to-one relationship that you're going to develop with your key mentor is the key asset that, that you can leverage. And that helps you know, companies like these. All right, thanks so much. Attention.